Our mm -hmm. pleasure to have Cole Toon here visiting us. Uh, he got his PhD from Rice in 2018, working on heavy ions at CMS, particularly looking into the whether or not the chiral magnetic effect exists at those energies and in a small system. He then moved to Brookhaven as a Gold Harbor Fellow and is currently an assistant staff scientist there. At Brookhaven, he splits his time between working on star on ultra peripheral collisions, uh, reanalyzing H1 data at HERA, and also on the EIC. Or collaborations with there and motivating why we should all go to the EIC. With that, we can take it away. Thank you. Thank you for a nice introduction. Uh, I'm very excited to give my first in person seminar after so many years now. Not only I'm excited to see all of you in three dimensions, which will be important to my talk, but mm -hmm. also I can use my fingers and hands to show you and my uh, laundry ball uh, to show you my physics. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about shining light through nuclear matter to see why they matter. And this is uh, how we understand the visible world around us. So when we talk about the visible world, what we really mean is the visible universe. And here I just wanted to show you, this is how far we can see across our universe. And it's about 93 billion light years in diameter. So this took you a good 20 seconds, at least for me, to write down all the zeros and see how huge uh, our universe is. However, in our universe, what we can actually see is not all the matters. There's only 5% of the total matter that is ordinary matter that is visible. And here in this, at Yale, we have experts from different fields, especially for dark matter and dark energy. And here, my research is focusing on this 5% of this visible matter. And during this talk, I'm going to show you how many problems that we still understanding in the ordinary matter. So here, um, that we have this question, and here's a very cool video from CERN, is what is the visible matter made of? And we have been asking this ourselves for thousands of years. And if we put in the objects closer and closer under the microscope, you look very deep and you see that from you know um, hundreds of microns down to the nanoscales. And then you see now all, all of these atoms and carbons. And finally, you're going to this empty space and all of a sudden, at some point you hit the nucleus. So the nucleus is a bounce of a neutron and proton. So the protons have three valence quarks, two up quarks and a down quark. And here, the research of high energy physics starts here, that we're trying to look at the fine and microscopic scale. And then, so we ask the question, so how can these quarks floating around in the proton or neutron? And uh, the answer is, it's the gluons. So we know for decades that the presence or the existence of gluons and how they carry the force between the quarks and gluons and bind them together. And we understand how to bind the protons and neutrons so as the atomic nuclei. Here, I just want to give you one example that is an interesting fact that the proton is about one GeV and the ups and downs, the quark is about five MeV, almost a thousand times different. And the gluon is zero. So where does this 99% of the mass come from? And we think about this whole universe is 5% visible, but 99% of that is unaccounted for. It's just not trivial that looking at this very simple number. So to put it more formally, this is known as uh, the quantum chromodynamics, the QCD, to describe this drawing structure. So as I told you about this confinement, this is known as the confinement problem where the quarks and gluons simply cannot live by itself in nature. And beyond one Fermi, this is about 16 tons. That's a huge number given this small scale. And on the right hand side, this is the very success of QCD, the asymptotic freedom. And because of the self interacting nature of gluons, where are you going to higher and higher energy scale or shorter and shorter distance scale? The interaction becomes very weak and is calculated. And then when you go the other extreme, and then you're actually going to the confinement where it's very non perturbative. And this is awarded the 2004 the Nobel Prize. But for the confinement, as we think about it, it's an outstanding puzzle. So the puzzle to a lot of people is not an if question. We know it has to happen. Otherwise, our own existence will prove it otherwise. But then the confinement puzzle is more of a how question. So how does the 
quark and gluon combine manifest in the property of matter in terms of, for example, the spin, uh, the mass that I just talked about, or the spin, or in terms of quantum structure. So here, if you want to study QCD, as I told uh, the grad students during lunch, I have been collecting my sands, uh, working on uh, many big colliders. I have worked on all four of these colliders. Let me just give you a very quick, very quick introduction. So Hera started from 91 to 2007, and it collides electron to proton. So what it means the electron proton collider is not the electron interacts with the proton, but emitting a virtual photon. So the photon is the probe that actually look inside the structure of the proton. And then the experiment that I've been working on is each one. Just by looking at the, the diagram, you see that this is really at least 30 years old. So here that we have some interesting uh, topics in H1 and trying to connect two ideas, which is the, the quark confinement or the quark long confinement with the quantum entanglement. And this is a new idea that we have been looking uh, in the recent years. Um, I don't have time to talk about this research uh, project, but if you're interested, uh, please uh, check out our uh, papers. And then the two other two uh, colliders, I'm sure you guys are familiar with, that we have the relativistic heavy ion collider and LHC, that you can collide hydrons together, not electron hydrons, but hydrons together. And Rick started in 2000, and LHC started 10 years later. And here is the two experiments. I told you already during lunch that the two experiments I've worked on. And here is what Helen just said, the so-called chiromagnetic effect, that we're studying the same problem of confinement, but we're using a different way. We're trying to deconfine. We're trying to use the deconfinement to understand the property. And that chirosymmetry that is believed to be restored in QGP, and that is sort of related to the mass problem. Um, and then this was featured as one of the editor's suggestions, but then I left the CMS, and then I move on to star experiments, uh, which will be the topic of today. And then this I will talk about towards the end of my talk. So finally, if you look at the time scale, every 10 years, there's a big collider coming up, and you wonder what's the next. And here is the electron ion collider. So we have collider for electron positron, electron proton, proton proton, or any combination, but electron ion. So there's a, a lot of physics behind it that we want to study. For example, that in the Scientific American, that uh, the magazine featured an article about electron emits a virtual photon. And this virtual photon will look inside of this nucleus. And there are many physics we can study. And then until 2020, very early, that right before the pandemic, the DOE, the Department of Energy, gave us the green light to go ahead to actually do this project. So there will be four pillars of this EIC science, and it's a spin, tomography, hydronization, and saturation. And what I will be focused on in my talk, it will be the tomography. So how does confinement manifest in the tomography? So after talking about these four wonderful machines, so what we actually do is that we are trying to do deep inelastic scattering. So the electron comes in. So I keep saying this because this is important, that you have a virtual photon from this electron. And this virtual photon will kick out one of the quark in the proton. And then there are only two very important kinematic variables. One is how is the resolution of this photon, how well you can look inside of the proton. And the other thing is so-called a momentum fraction is where how much momentum this quark is carrying to the entire proton. So naively, if you think about this three valence quark picture of a proton, each quark will carry one third of the momentum. And this entire measurement called DIS, you only need to measure the scattered electron. It's kind of counterintuitive because you don't care about the final state, it just exploded. But you only measure the scattered electron, you, you understand these two kinematic variables. So then now let's look at the, the proton sitting at rest. You see three quarks and you see two ups and one down, maybe a few gluons. But the interesting happens when you start to accelerate. So when you start, uh, start to accelerate it, you're seeing more gluons. And if you keep accelerating it, at some point, the relativistic effect kicks in. So this is something really mind-blowing to me, at least fascinating, that it's not the physics that's changed because we know the physics cannot be changed 
in a different frame. The gluon is always there, but because you accelerate it, you sort of slow them down, right? And then you started to see the gluon <laughs> slow down and you finally you see them. So put, put it more formally, this is so-called a popcorn distribution function. So to understand it is sort of the probability of finding a particular kind of popcorn giving a momentum fraction. And as you see that, a low momentum fraction or high momentum fraction or low energy, you see free valence quark, but you start accelerated, you're seeing more gloom. So this particle distribution function tells you just formally exactly that message that you can precisely map out what the particle distributions inside of a proton. So here, the data, as you see, is from Para, as they introduced earlier, is an electron proton collider. We have very precise data. So what about the nuclei? And that is sort of the motivation we're going to this electron ion collider. Here is um, so-called the confinement gets modified in the heavy nuclei. And uh, here, this plot is showing you qualitatively what this proton, this PDF in a bound nucleon. So you put the proton neutron inside of the nucleus and you compare with the free proton. And then if the ratio is at one, that means there's no interesting effect. It's exactly the same as the free proton. But you see from this plot, this is nothing but one. And for this entire landscape that we have high momentum and the low momentum fraction is dominated by the quark regime, right? Remember that this more at rest is three valence quark known as the EMC region, or you're going down to lower X or higher energy that you started to dominate by blue one. And this is, I just want to give you an analogy because this room is mostly a lot of uh, heavy ion physicists. And this is sort of like the RAA. Right? This is the cold RAA, the nuclear modification factor without a QTT. So you ask why? What is the fundamental mechanism changing the proton distribution inside of the nucleus than a free proton? There could be two naive possibilities. First of all, we know nucleus, we know free proton, we never mentioned neutron because nucleus is a bound state of proton and neutron. And the second is they are not a bag of ping pong ball putting together. They have interaction. How are we going to account for the interaction? So here we know that neutron is our sister of the proton, but have very different properties. First of all, it has a little higher mass, but then that put in the, you know, uh, a beta decay because the lifetime is very short and also neutron has zero electric charge. So it's very hard technology in the technology to accelerate it, not like proton. So to understand the neutron structure is difficult. So how to study the platonic structure of neutron? We use the next available source, which is the deuteron. Because deuteron, you know, if you pay attention to this math, that you subtract the proton or the proton and the neutron mass, it's only a very loosely bound system. So you can think of it's a system with proton and neutron, and then if you do DIS measurement without knowing which one you're hitting, the target, then you naively believe that it's just the Duron structure minus, you know, sort of figured out it from the free proton structure, and you can understand the neutron structure. But of course, what about the interaction? They are in a bound state. They are not free nucleon. They have to interact. So this is indeed the case where it's the simplest case you can build. It is two body system. You have this proton neutron interact back to back in their red frame. So they have a momentum K. And in the early days, you can do this experiment and measure this K distribution. And indeed, so one Fermi is about 200 MeV. Mostly they are very low momentum. So you can sort of treat them as a free nucleon but it does have a distribution and it could get more interaction by looking at this case. So the neutron is not free. This naive recipe doesn't work. And the question is how to get to the free neutron. Here is where the EIC comes in. Uh, very interesting because EIC can provide the necessary tools to measure the free neutron. So now imagine the neuron is boosted and you have a DIS measurement hitting the neutron. And of course, the deuteron break up. And if you happen to have a proton detector in the forward direction, then you can do a little bit of reverse engineer. Because if you measure the proton in your forward detector and you know your Lorentz boost because you know your beam momentum, 
then you can do the reverse engineer, understand event by event, what the K internal momentum before it was collided. And then the beauty of this collider kinematic is why Jefferson lab, let's say a fixed party experiments cannot measure this because one thing that's important there they're missing is the deuteron was boosted at a beam momentum so that in the rest frame it's not zero in, in the left frame it's not zero so you can actually measure down to zero momentum in the rest frame. so that's a game changer comparing to eic versus other low energy or fixed target experiments and you also have to have a neutron detector there because the neutron was destroyed by the dis and you know that there's empty in a neutron detector with all of this information you can figure it out event by event the nucleon that was hit was neutron and with the internal momentum minus k so now you have the full initial state configuration event by event and you can start measuring the free neutron so here is the work that we have been doing that pay attention to this momentum scale so you pack the proton you measure the momentum and finally you see this is a very low momentum and you can extrapolate to so-called a free neutron point. And this free neutron point is given by the nuclear structure. We have a deuteron pole. And because that pole is unphysical, it's a negative momentum. And what it means is that two nucleons are sitting infinitely far away to each other, which is unphysical because if they are infinitely far away, they are not a deuteron in the first place. But then the good thing about the deuteron is it's very loosely bound. It's very easy to extrapolate to that free neutron point. So if you measure that point, that is the true neutron structure. And this is enabled by so-called the EIC far forward detectors, meaning that the hadron beam going direction, there are some detector at the very down uh, the, the beam line to detect those breakouts. And so far, the free neutron structure, the true free neutron structure can only be measured by the EIC. And this was featured as one of the answers in this. And by the way, so this whole model is called Beagle. It's a kind of cute, but uh, you know, when we justify what the model calls, um, that it, they even ask us why this is Beagle. Um, but then this is actually a general purpose EA Monte Carlo model. Uh, this is uh, under PI. And we have recent, uh, a very comprehensive overview of Beagle. And this is the only Monte Carlo model we can do for a general purpose for the EIC. So the two sides of the same point. From free nucleon, we are going to the other side, which is the strongly interacting nucleon nucleus. So now, remember we have this plot that we have a lot of suppression or modification, and we want to understand where this suppression or modification comes from. And uh, here we could actually have the strong interaction region, which is the high momentum tail between the protons and neutrons. Here, that the, the momentum and the position are the conjugate variable here. So remember the free neutron, we have to go to you know very low momentum to be very far away. Or the, other, the opposite is also true, that if you want to go to high momentum, they are very close in the deuteron system. So here, what we want to try is, if you ask yourself the question, what makes a difference between deuteron and heavy nuclear? One thing you can come up with is, is the density. But if in my experiment, I can make the deuteron to be very close by the two proton, the proton and neutron, and have a very local density, will that mimic the physics in heavy nuclear? And that's exactly what we're trying to test is this universality whether this EMC puzzle, where this suppression or modification was driven by the configuration or the local densities or the off shell of this nuclear. And this is only enabled by the forward tagging program. And this is exactly what we did, that in, again, in this Beagle model, that we have this strong nuclear suppression seen at a high momentum. Now you pay attention to the momentum scale, not at zero, because that's free nucleon. You're going to high momentum, and you see that there's a huge suppression. So this is the experiments that we propose to measure at the EIC. And if we can establish that, that suppression is as big as the medium to heavy nuclei. And that we can finally maybe put the EMC puzzle to an end. 
So here, I just tell you about this new DIC tagging program. And I want to tell you that this was not in the DIC white paper, so-called, you know, the white paper established in DIC science. And this was really a work that established at Bokema. And I want to tell you that this detector, you see that this, you have four different detectors, this so-called off-momentum detector is a direct result of our physics program. Because simply, when we're doing this breakup, this deuteron breakup, there's nothing there you can detect this neutron or proton, actually proton. So we put a detector there, now it's in the baseline. So there's not only the deuteron tagging, there are more other ions, and you can also polarize the deuteron, and you can play with it in many different kinds of setups. And there's a lot of ongoing theory and experiments about this. So a little bit ago, I tell you about these structures, this, you know, Lorentz boost, and you're seeing a lot of the gluons. But what it really is, it's still a one-dimensional structure because what we're looking at is the momentum fraction in this longitudinal beam momentum. But the EIC actually can provide tools to look at three dimensions. So <laughs> we're really going to a three dimension and not only to look at the X, which is longitudinal momentum, but also in the transverse direction. So we can have the entire picture of this three-dimensional object. So here that I want to bring back just one example that on the deuteron, since you guys are already familiar with what the deuteron, and we can look at this very high proton neutron configuration where, okay, here's my laundry box. These two things are very close by to each other. And then we use our so-called glorious uh, discovery from Brookhaven uh, that we have a J-Psi particle. So the J-Psi particle was the confirmation of charm quark. And here you have a photon comes in and you produce a J-Psi such that you know you're sensitive to the gluons. And if you also have the forward tagging, so you know event by event, if the deuteron is like this or this, you can start to do more 3D structures. And here it's a very simple, by momentum conservation, if you measure the J-Psi momentum and you know the photon momentum, momentum conservation, you know the gluon momentum. And then if you know the gluon momentum, there are conjugate variable, then you know the gluon position. So that is how you get to the gluon position in the nucleon. And this is exactly what we propose. So this work that we have looking at the right-hand side, this is sort of the transverse profile, the size of this gluonic radius of the proton. And we have sensitivity to say that if this gluonic radius is actually going against each other, making a smaller radius proton or a stretch that is a, a larger proton. And this is only enabled that you can have the tagging, you have the deuteron, and you have this big size particle. So the same idea can be applied to heavy nuclei. So now exactly the same logic. And this was actually in the EIC white paper. It's called a golden channel. So you can do a tomography of how does this gluon distribute inside of the nucleus. And this is something that you cannot replace it with the deuteron because your question is asking why the heavy nucleus form in the first place. You want to see the gluon distribution inside of the nucleus. Here again, because it's important, I want to remind you the J psi momentum and then the photon momentum gives you the gluon momentum. And then from the momentum, you know the position. And voila, this is what it looks like uh, that we put in the model that you have a gluon spatial distribution in this uh, transverse uh, dimension. And because they are conjugate variable, we put in, in the model that if all the gluons are populated in the nucleon, and we have a wood saxon distribution of where this nucleon sits on average, you do the Fourier transformation and you get this very iconic diffractive momentum distribution. So at the EIC, what we propose is to measure this diffractive pattern very accurately and precisely, such that you can do it the reverse engineer, that you can map out the gluon spatial distribution. And of course, here is just an example or just a model what we actually need to measure is this momentum distribution. However, there's a problem that if this nucleus breaks up, that this diffractive pattern won't be visible because as you think you have a very big nucleus and you start probing it. And if you want to know the size, you know, you can't probe too hard because if you probe too hard, you will break it up or probe inside of the nucleus. So this is what happens if you probe too hard 
is so-called the incoherent production, where the nucleus simply breaks up. And that became your background. And as you see this very flattened line, that is the incoherent production. And if you cannot separate these two, then you will be simply the first peak and then everything covered by this incoherent production. So again, if you want to measure the gluon spatial distribution, you need the nucleus to stay intact and you can measure this uh, distribution. But then if you have this break it up, then you only measure the incoherent production. So here is a study um, that we are trying to understand the background. So we simulate again using uh, the model I developed here called Beagle, and you have the incoherent production. What we want to do is to make use of the nature that the nucleus will break up. If it breaks up, where will those particles go? The particle will go in the far forward directions, and we have a lot of detectors there to veto those breakups, event by event. And you see that from the line here. We have a multiple vetoes like no neutron in the ZDC, no proton in this off momentum and Roman pot, no photon, no proton in this uh, D0 tracker. You can get the first minima, which is this minima, but then the second and the third, you still have about a factor four to go. So this is still a very active ongoing project that in the EIC, that in order to measure this gluon distribution, we need to measure this uh, incoherent or suppress this incoherent uh significantly so this work is uh led by my grad student Wang Chong who graduated last year so EIC is not just an idea that out of the blue it was actually very carefully thought about and planned so that coming from the 10 years ago the white paper all the way to 2020 the CD0 that DOE gave us a green light and how about now in 2023 so epic so this is the name of our collaboration, the EPIC detector. This is a very new detector concept and very complicated. We have a new magnet, 1.7 Tesla. We have calorimeters, we have tracking, we have PID. And again, this is the far forward detector. It's now putting in the context. This is the hadron beam going directions. And looking at the last detector, ZVC is about 28 meters now to be in one. And that is sort of the scale when you're looking at this detector. So in this epic, I do computing and software, and I'm mostly focusing on the physics simulation uh, because I work on Monte Carlo generator. So there are opportunities with epic, and epic is a very young collaboration. On Tuesday, we just had our spokesperson and panel meeting committee, and we want to build this collaboration. We don't have any other leadership yet. We want to build this uh, for uh, the next generation scientists with DEI in mind. We really want to, from the ground up, that we will have this right. And also, we'll have a lot of power projects. This is a $2 billion project with a lot of funding opportunities, a lot of experience in R&D and, and building the project. So this is the first EIC full simulation. So I wanted to tell you, this is a dream came true, right? It's about 15, 20 years people put in this concept. And this is the first time we put everything together, calorimeters, tracking, everything and simulate a physics event. So I'm very lucky to be working on this very iconic diffractive pattern physics that you see that this is the J psi, and we want to measure this. And if you put it into detector simulation, which is driven by, by the way, this is the calorimeters and the EM cal in the electron going direction, and this is the tracker, then you have some smearing. Of course, it's not ideal, but we're still in the process of optimizing, and we're going in full speed towards the technical design report. So what can we learn about the QCD uh, before the EIC? We, have to, we still have to wait about 10 years. How can we learn about the QCD confinement even before that? So I have talked about this fourth machine. So there's one way to study this confinement. I call it the little EIC. And this, this little EIC is something in between. It's like a hybrid version, right? You're you doing so-called ultra peripheral collision that you're utilizing Rick and LHC, the hadron machine. And then when these two, okay, now it's not nuclear, it's nucleus, you're passing by each other. And because of the highly Lorentz contracted EM field, it can emit photons. Right? And these photons from one nucleus can hit the other nucleus. And you think about it, that's exactly what EIC is doing. Right? Yeah, I see you have an electron and it emits a photon. This photon interacts with the nucleus. 
So this ultra peripheral collision is a very unique program. It's called the collisions that don't collide. They don't interact hadronically, but they have the photon interact with the nucleus. So what's the difference? If we have UPC, why do we have to have EIC? So EIC, as I told you, that we can use this Q square, which is the resolution of the photon to characterize your event. Um, and then this is not the case in the UPC because in UPC, we do not know what the photon resolution because we can't detect them, but we can only infer that from the final state particles, for example, the mass. And this is exactly like a lot of what you guys do, right? You mentioned jet, the jet PT, the mass give you a hard scale. So here is exactly the same idea. But UPC, because the LHC has huge energy, you can do a photon, a photon nucleon energy at almost a TV. So this is very high energy comparing to the EIC. EIC only about 9 to 90 GV. So there are complementarity between these two machines. And of course, the EIC, as I talked about, about the far forward coverage, they have a lot of space. I mean, the detectors to detect the breakup. But at Rick and the LNC, you do not have such things. So now I've been talking about this program about deuteron that you have a new tagging program, you produce a JSI, or you can just do exactly the measurements in gold nucleus and do the 3D structure. Now, instead of the electron beams, I can replace it with the gold nucleus beam. And this is sort of, I call it the preview of the EIC physics and see how far we can go. So this is the EIC, I mean, UPC program at RIC. Again, this is the picture of RIC. You have gold gold UPC, you have deep neuron gold UPC, and you have a proton uh, gold. So the, the photons are coming from the gold and hitting the B because the charge are very different. And so this is a very versatile program with different species, energy, and even polarization that I won't talk about today, but the proton can be polarized. And this will be sensitive to a very wide range of EIC physics. And probably I don't have to justify why I'm interested in eagle because it has a deuteron there and you can have photon hitting the deuteron. So this is exactly what we did. So we have observed the first deuteron called UPC JSI and with some tagging. So this is the important part. So now you see that the photon comes in, you do a gluon because you, you, you measure the JSI particle and remember the momentum of these two guys, you sort of know what the gluon momentum is. And here the neutron is the spectator. So the group, the neutron will fly straight to the forward direction. And why we only have the ZVC because we don't have other detectors in this run to, to detect the other breakup. So we'll see what we can do with this uh, experiment. It turned out it's really helpful and interesting that this is an event display that when we measure the JSI particle, the JSI decays to electron positron and the neutron spectator goes down the beam line to the ZVC. And this is a very, this is data, this is very clean neutron peak, and you only have one neutron peak, because in this event, you only have one neutron in the system. And at some point, this is a very clean signal. Uh, and then you see that the, the gold go inside, it doesn't have anything, because the goal here is only a photon provider. It doesn't do anything but providing a photon. And then the neuron will break up, and one guy going in forward, and the other guy becoming the active nucleon produced with a side particle. So this is the data uh, that was last year published in JRL that we see the total data, which is on the JSI, with the open data that is neutron cast. That means the neutron is detected in the forward direction. And you see that, you remember the idea is that the coherent is when the deuteron stay intact, but it's very hard because there's only 2.2 MeV binding energy. You tickle it and it breaks up. And then when it breaks, it's incoherent production. And this is very in line with what the model thinks that is incoherent production. So the message here is that we measure the first such measurements of UPC, where you measure the first gluon momentum distributions. And then this again is remember the Fourier transformation to the position space, we know the gluon distribution, and also the first incoherent production with some forward tagging. So only because of this tagging. You know that between these two models, which I'm not going into detail, but the model that describes the data better is the one that describes the incoherent better. And see here, that's what went into the model. 
is that the gluon density fluctuates. And this is what really makes this model is better than the other model on this data that describe the data is that the gluon density inside of this nucleon, they are actually very different event by event. They are fluctuating. So how about the heavy nucleus? Again, the same tool as the DIC and the UPC. And you see that this is the data from Sa, very new data. And you see that we have the iconic peak at very low momentum and flat now. And remember why this is the case? It's because remember in the EIC white paper, we have a coherent diffractive peak. But as I said, the incoherent background is very hard to deal with. If you add this to up, that's exactly what you get, right? You see the first peak, but then all the structures of coherent production is covered. You only have the incoherent production. So this is really as expected, the incoherent events dominant at the high momentum range. Um, and then with this, that we can just sort of see the first peak, but not the, the rest of this diffractive pattern. And at the EIC, the, the goal is trying to separate the incoherent and the coherent so we can measure both. So since we don't have the diffractive pattern, what can we do with the data? It turned out there's a lot of stuff we can study with the data at hand. So remember the incoherent production is sort of sensitive to the fluctuation, because if you pro hard enough inside of the nucleon, you're starting to be sensitive to the, to, the, to the fluctuation. So here that you see the data and the one line, this green line that describes this tail is the one so-called with the fluctuation. So what does that mean? So what it really means is that it looks like this, that now you're not having a smooth gluon distribution inside of your nucleus, you are seeing event by event, it's spiky and very large fluctuation. So it's not a constant picture, it's actually a fluctuating picture. So we have a very strong evidence for the first time to see the gluon density fluctuate inside of the, the nucleus. And this is actually a very important lesson or input to the hydronic collisions of heavy ion collisions. Because in heavy ion collisions now, a lot of the, the physics is about this initial state and we want to understand this initial state, we want to understand the fluctuation. So I have many data to show you, but I'm not going to go into uh, this is actually being prepared uh, for the journal. So I want to stress one more time, the gluon structures, there are two aspects. One is the coherent part, which is only the EIC can measure to have a very smooth gluon distribution. But also you have a UPC measurement, you can measure the incoherent production because that comes right now. And you say, let me give you an analogy, right? So what's the difference between the, the average gluon density and the event by event fluctuation? What does it even mean? So it's like, you, I live in Brooklyn, you're going to Manhattan, you check the, the, the traffic, right? The Google give you an average. It can be you know one hour, but this is really an average time. It can be 30 minutes, or two hours, depending on the traffic. Here, that if you want to do it now, I just wanted to see now, it varies a lot because it's a Monday morning or Saturday morning. This is exactly what happened. Event by event, this variation is very huge. And this is was actually underestimated uh, in a lot of the models. And this fluctuation will be constrained to a lot of our physics, even in heavy ion. So there are further opportunities, as you see. I just gave you just an example. But utilizing the RIC and the LHC machine, um, we can have a lot of the UPC studies. So one thing that we want to study, um, as I want to, uh, to emphasize, is we can do not only the vector meson, like a JSI, sensitive to gluons, but we can also do jets. So there's an ongoing study with Yuri uh, Petrenko and by some his students at Ohio State. Um, I just want to give you an idea. This is how serious work nowadays, you know, on, over Zoom. And you see that Yuri was really thinking hard, what's the jet PT we should use in this experiment. So we are also at the experimentalist, we're not sitting uh, just uh, waiting. We're also trying to measure the jets in UPC at RIC. And this is really trying to utilize the four detectors in stock. And this four detectors has a very unique kinematics that we can measure the J-side so-called threshold production. And that is very interesting. Uh, connected to the origin of mass. 
And also we can have polarized proton and that was sensitive to spin effect. And maybe even the first time we can measure so-called bi metal. And then of course, going to the LHC, the ALICE detector, we have a higher energy collisions. As I show you, you have a very wide range of energies and you can do many things with your run four and run four data. And maybe this ALICE detector, I don't need to really introduce to you. Um, we can study many things that, for example, one cool idea is this gluonic structure of pion. We can actually study pion structure when a proton flying and it fluctuates into a neutron and pion, you have a pion cloud. And if you happen to have a J size scattered right off the pion, you can in principle study the pion structure of the gluon. And you can also have ultron productions and you can have many jet measurements, inclusive jet and diffractive jet. So here is the EIC science. I want to remind you, this is the QCD confinement trying to manifest in the visible manner. And there are four pillars. EIC science cannot be covered in one talk. So I just want to summarize that in this talk, I talk about the demography, that we established the new EIC program enabled by the forward tagging, where you can tag a spectator from the deuteron, for example, and we study the very important measurements, the two sides of the same point either the free nucleon or strongly interacting nucleon. And we also can do gluon tomography of nucleon, but we can also do it for big nucleus. And then we also establish experimental program in EPIC that to realize this golden channel. It's nowhere trivial, but there's a lot of opportunities uh, and work to be done. And finally, I want to say that the science of the UPC and heavy ion program it's the same as the EIC science program, but we can actually have the hydronic machine to tell us a little bit uh, ahead of us, ahead of uh, the EIC. And this is a truly complement uh, complementary program to the EIC science. So all of these EIC measurements actually will be sensitive and can be sensitive to spin, hydronization, and saturation. It's not only to tomography. I want to make this clear. So there are other activities for my group. I uh, just wanted to show you Yang, uh, my new postdoc. Uh, he studies spin effect, as I told you, it's one of the pillars. And he also studied the so-called Cherenkov detectors. And I have wonderful Swedish students, I have told you during lunch. Um, and they actually, wonderful, we're doing something new. We're doing quantum information science. Uh, we actually published a paper on uh, using quantum computer. And also we have uh, Alex uh, working on a bot four detector, the postdoc, and one child, my grad students, uh, who just graduated last year, working on a Beagle event generator model. And uh, we are really interested in the ideas of hybridization, especially in the nuclear target fragmentations. And again, Xiao Shen, by the way, that's just guest speakers in a few weeks. Uh, we're going to talk about saturation, but we are actually collaborating, talking about saturation and also jet physics. And this is just the publication from them. So finally, this is towards the end of my talk that the uh, star will have um, 23 to 25. We will have three more years of running. Um, and then at least that will be in the next decade. We have some uh, run three and run four. And then finally, this is the detector that I've been working on or the concept I've been working on for the past five years. And hopefully that we'll have it uh, start running in 2034 um, together that all of this QCD machine is to, uh, for me, is trying to study the QCD confinement. And again, that EIC, that we will have a precision frontier that we can study things really precise. We have a lot of detectors in handle, and UPC has the complementary of energy regime and a different probe, and we can study many things at the UPC. So with that, um, thank you. And uh, I want to acknowledge that many of my mentors and students and postdocs behind this. I want to give them uh, the right person. Thank you. We have some time for questions. Hi, um, nice talk. Can you go back to the slide where you had the comparison between uh, the UPCs and then the EIC collision? Oh. That, that, uh, yeah, there yeah. you go. Yeah. So I can understand why um, you need UPCs to see these event by event fluctuations in the initial state, but I guess it's just not clear to me why, if you know the event by event fluctuations, you can't also sort of get to this more average picture. So, like, 
How does the EIC give us more yeah. information? So actually, I, of course, there's details I didn't yeah. talk about is because when you remember this incoherent production, you're actually sensitive to the level of the nucleon, right? So it's the inside, it's inside of the nucleus, and then you're seeing the platonic structures. Right. So this is a, a model that putting everything together. But in experiment, what you're really sensitive is to the nucleon, right? right? You see the fluctuation in there, but you wouldn't know how big the room is. Right? You wouldn't know what the how big the nucleus is and what's the fine structure of this gluon populated inside of the entire nucleus. You really need a probe that to probe coherently with the entire nucleus to sort of see the average of this nucleon. Uh, I mean, a part on distribution. So that's a, actually a fundamental difference at the, sort of the uh, the degree of freedom, right? You're, you're looking at a part. Okay. Okay. Good question. Uh, uh, Can I just follow that up? Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. some fluctuations yeah. and incoherence. Um, so you, in STAR, you measure, you have this curve where you show that uh, you, I think it's the one after this, maybe? Yeah. Um, you show, yeah, the incoherent part, it which is, is no, it, it was one, this one. Mm -hmm. So you have the green dotted line right. with fluctuations. Right. So, um, to what extent do current models of the initial state incorporate, or do you set the scale for those models for this, uh, these fluctuations? So, Let's say the one, let's say comparison, like apple to apple, mm. the one that without it, it's like you only set the position of the nucleon. And you say, okay, in this nucleon, you have a smooth proton, a smooth okay. nucleon, and you use Wu Saxon, you simulate it. Or in this way, you really, event by event, every nucleon, you have platonic degree of freedom, and you let it, you have some fluctu Gaussian fluctuations, where you have some, the so called hotspot uh, model. So models like IP plasma, yes. do they uh, agree with this? This is curve? actually coming from the IP plasma. Okay. Model, right? So this is the same okay. people. Thank you. Sorry. Um, no, that's okay. I had a question on the ethnic like JXI um, that the Monte Carlo referred to the execution. I think it was I don't remember which one. Yeah, this one. So um, it's like, so this is like the Monte Carlo um, like reconstruction versus the expectation of the reconstruction, right. right? So you were saying that like you're trying to improve these, but how will you improve them if you don't know like how the response of the detector, like you can simulate it to the best of your ability, but you don't know yet. No, so, so this is based on the detector simulation. Okay. Right, so we have an EM cell, it's like 20,000 crystals. Mm -hmm. And we really need to talk with the detector experts, you know, how to really implement this detector simulation and see if we can realize it in real life. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of the, the communication that we are doing and trying to improve it. So it's not only an algorithm level, but also a hardware level okay. improvement. So it's also like mm -hmm. ideally you would apply the calibrations that you'll collect right. the data or something, and then these curves should basically fit close. Not calibration per se, but then yes, sort of. Okay. You, you basically need to understand re the detector response of your EM cal good enough, right? What is the, mm -hmm. let's say, resolution? You have your some tails, right? How does this really go into this observable particularly? And mm -hmm. then you can see, okay, where I can, you know, make my calorimeter better, or if it's because, you know, some of this here is sitting too close, or, you know, a lot of the you know, practical consideration goes in. And if you have a good simulation, you can sort of guess. You know, what okay, so this will be used to basically see where you can make the best like physics gains based on like small changes to your. Yeah, so we are doing so-called a benchmark. Mm -hmm. So it's like a quick turnaround, right? So we have a geometry very complicated and you change something mm -hmm. and we keep the analysis flow the same and then we run it one more time. Mm -hmm. Okay, this point goes down. That point goes up, yeah. and then we say, okay, this configuration doesn't work very well. You know, scratch that. Okay. Things like that. If that's what you're. Talking. Yeah, yeah, that is Thank you. Yeah, maybe this one. Yeah. So, uh, so thanks for the very nice talk. So you started with this big question of where the mass comes from, and then we're going to say, let's say we have perfect 3D tomography of these 
the grounds. So what does that say? Where does the mass come from? Or can we answer that question? That so this has been a very active uh, topic. Um, one of the things I want to point to um, is in the EIC, what we can measure, or even the UPC in our lease, which is uh, what I'm very interested in. Um, I, I tell you what the observable is and then why, why it matters. So it's the oops along your threshold production. So when you're doing exactly the same scattering at a low energy, which is a whoops saw mass, you're not sensitive to the gluons anymore. You're sensitive to the form factor of this so-called energy momentum sensor. And that is directly connected to the mass of this. So naively, how are you going to measure the mass? You can come up with a graviton and scatter with the probe. Right? That's the most direct way to measure your mass. But of course, that is becoming very hard. So you have to build something else, right? So one thing that uh, they have been very active in theory trying to overcome this problem, which is you do a heavy coconia, and then you bring it down to the lowest energy, such that you will be sensitive to this um, energy momentum tensor relative to the, to the mass. Um, so this is what, why we want to propose um, that see my first backup slide. Yeah. The proton mass radius, for example, this is one aspect, right? This is the glue S experiment, and you measure some of this exactly this T distribution, and this is at the threshold of the J side production. So there is like Dima Kazi and trying to argue that in this energy regime at this threshold, you're directly this is measuring the form factor of this uh, energy. So you sort of know where, where this mass is sitting and you have a mass distribution. So that is getting one step close to where this is. And this is really interesting. And he said, J side might not be, you know, the hard scale might not be hard enough. So the ideal case will be Upsilon. This only can be done at the EIC or in the run for at least the very cool. Maybe somebody from the outside might have a question. We have a few minutes for a short question. So maybe I'll ask one. Can you talk a little bit about, you showed a, you know, a broad range of other programs. Can you talk a little bit about some of the quantum yeah. institute? Yeah. So, okay. So I, I had the lunch with the grad students and, and so on. And they asked me, they asked a much harder question. But, <laughs> um, they asked me what's the example, what do you vision of your you know, mentoring and stuff. So this is my example. So Wenji and Kala um, was my, my SUNY student. And I really asked them, what do you want to work on? And they're very interested in quantum, you know, the sophomore year at the time. So at the time we had a news about IBM collaborated with BNL. So we started to say, hey, how about we think about problem simulate on quantum computing? So this is what we come with, that we're trying to simulate two lambda particles. The lambda particle in our field is a very good probe for spin. So then we think if we're talking about spin, this is like very similar to a Bell inequality test. So what we think is we're doing high energy scattering and we produce, let's say, a lambda and lambda bar. Let's say a strength and an anti-strength work. I don't care about hard rock. And then they have spin correlation. So this project is trying to simulate this spin correlation on a quantum computer. And then we can try to embed some of these light quarks. And uh, we want to measure the spin correlation and map this problem to a condensed matter problem, like a spin chain problem, right? We think about this quark and gluons, they are like a spin chain on our PCBs. And then yeah, this is the project that we're doing. Um, and then this is the quantum computer project. And then Jan was hired because of this project. And we're actually measuring a lambda and lambda bar correlation in PP collision. And this is very exciting. I didn't show you because it's not the cool. Um, because it's very new. Uh, but we actually see some signals that the spin, they are actually correlated. Uh, this is uh, what I think. So for heavy ion physics for the, I don't know, 20, 30 years, we're looking at mostly momentum correlation. Low and but this is the first measurement. You're gonna do the spin correlation. You actually have some quantum. 
And in the quantum system, and in, in the sort of less matter of quantum right. system, is it faithful enough to the the heavy ion system if you're actually learning so, something? Right. right. So we actually turned this problem around, right? We're not trying to learn quantum mechanics from heavy ion collision. That's probably the wrong tool. What we want to do is to see, based on what we know from quantum mechanics, and we want to see what happens in the QCD vacuum or in the QCD medium. For example, these bell inequalities, we know very precisely what bell inequality is correlation is. And we want to see if we embed it into a QCD string or in the QCD environment, would that be a disappearance? Or would that be some modification of these inequalities in QCD? So that is sort of the angle we're going the other way around to find it. Out. So, uh, maybe you could take us back to the EMC effect. Sure. Yes. And um, I mean, you, you were saying in uh, electron deuteron collisions, right. for example, uh, yes, just show the curve. Yeah, yeah there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you were saying uh, you were trying to say that you could make measurements. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about the EMC yet, uh, where the proton and neutron are close together. Mm -hmm. And so you would measure, uh, you know, the, the neutron forward, for example. Right. Now, and when you say they're close together, you also said something about density in nuclei. Right. 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 Okay. So, wasn't, I mean, in the EMC, Experiments they use different nuclei, right? right. Mm -hmm. So, would, yeah. mm -hmm. would they not have already more or less done this? Yeah, they didn't have the tool to do this, they have deuteron. That's right. So, the idea here is mostly we're using deuteron as a baseline because deuteron is very loosely yeah. bound. Here, what I'm interested in is trying to build this universality class where. The deuteron can be in a rare configuration such that maybe it has the nuclear effect in heavy nucleus. So the analogy here is really like in heavy ion collision, we see flow, we see a lot of things. But about 10 years earlier that we see in small systems is not because PP just have you know collectivity or, or, or you're actually a very rare configuration. You're pumping into a lot of multiplicity. Here, the idea is sort of the same. You're not looking at an average configuration. You're looking at a very rare high momentum configuration. And uh, the, the, the hypothesis is that the heavy nuclei, there are many of this kind of nuclear nuclear interaction at very short distances. And if that is the reason why EMC effect is, then I will be able to mimic this effect exactly in the deuteron. So if we can build this connection, that sort of putting a definitive answer of why UNC, because so far we have no idea why UNC. Okay. 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 Is anyone else on? Okay. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, let's thank Colin again for a wonderful talk.